So, JB, you you are uh, you are a gentleman of leisure is how you introduce yourself. Right. But to uh, to some of us, that means a pimp. Um, what uh, where would you grow up? I grew up in Beaumont, Texas. Uh, my mom was from Beaumont, Texas. My dad was from Port Arthur, Texas. So they're about 15 miles away from each other. And uh, it's a very family oriented uh, town and community. I had, uh, but this was the mid 80s. So my, my mom and my dad were never together. She married another guy and he was well off. They was everybody working in the refinery industry around there, uh, petrochemicals. And so, um, like I said, this was right around the crack epidemic and he got caught up in the crack thing. And so then I moved to stay with my grandmother. And uh, and then my granny, I stayed with her like four years old. And you know, granny, she trying to instill that wisdom in you that she messed up with her child. So she got a second chance. So my grandmother was uh, a phenomenal woman. And uh, you know, she, like on Saturdays before I could go out to play, I had to read Proverbs because she was really trying to instill wisdom into me. And so um, that's been just a recurring theme of my life, reading books, I love to read. She was a reader. She woke up every day and read her Bible every day, mm. every day of my life. And so when this woman got Alzheimer's, then I started to ask some questions because I heard her prayers and I heard her pray to be kept in her right mind. And so when she lost her mind, that really started uh, the change in my life because I started to read. I started to have some questions about religion and then that led down to the rabbit hole where I had a complete break from society where I was just like, I don't want to be a part of this at all. And then that's how I ended up in the underworld. And uh, as you say, like a professional gentleman of leisure, we do have to be careful with that word because when they arrest somebody on TV and he's a sex trafficker or he's a uh, sex offender and he's doing all these crazy things, they're going to call him a pimp. That's what they're going to call it because that's the way to discourage or whatever, you know. So, no, I'm not a pimp. I'm a professional gentleman of leisure. Well, I mean, uh, so many the you know pimps are the most hated. One of the most right. hated next to next to sex offenders. You're probably one of the most hated segments of society in, right. in the U.S. But what I think a lot of white people or, or wealthy people don't understand is what the reality of life is in the hood. Right. And we'll talk about that in a bit. Right. Um, that, that's really why you're here. Because oh, you, you have we, you and I had a great phone phone conversation the other day, right? And uh, and I said you you got to come in here. So here you are, because right. you, you're based now in in Vegas, right? I've been in Vegas, but you know I'm still a little bit nomadic, a little bit. But I've been in Vegas for about the past seven months, and uh, I'm probably going to be going to Dallas tomorrow. But yeah, uh, I love to have the whole racism conversation. Yeah, we're we're going to that, that's going to be the bulk okay. of this talk. But I just want to set a little groundwork. So so you you got introduced to the game. At what age, roughly? Oh, I was 28. I was. I had. I. I actually. I went to college. I uh, graduated from college. I worked in corporate America for three years as a, a field service engineer. I was working for Siemens in Energy, and so my degree was in electrical engineering. And uh, <laughs> so you're educated, right? Come so, from a fairly good family. Great family. Uh, I did everything the right way, growing up to 28, and then, like I said, I started to really study some things and understand that really though my whole life had kind of been plotted and planned by a white supremacists about 400 years ago. That he had kind of plotted my whole life in the sense that I was raised around a lot of women. My, I wasn't with my father. Uh, I'd, I'd seen him on the weekends, but uh, I was heavy in the church. I was So I was pretty much scared of everything. Uh, I went to college and I was about to go through 40 years of servitude after college. And my whole life, had, and I, when I kind of understood that, and I think a lot of black men are going through the same thing, when you find out the truth of your culture and who you really are and what's kind of been hidden from you, then you have a wild out moment. You have a moment where you're like, everybody been lying to me. Like, everybody's hiding the truth from me. And so you, you know, you rebel. And see, what's really so cold is that the white supremacists playing their part too. So when you rebel, then you end up in the system. So it's like this double edged sword. So it's just like uh, coming into all of that knowledge. And then, uh, so I started to really study the whole system. And I come across uh, 
experts and um, doctors who were way smarter than me who was really trying to understand systemic racism and after reading all the reading their books I'm, I'm you know a gentleman of leisure so I have time to read I might not do a lot physically but like we said I don't never get a mental break anytime you in the streets or in the underworld and you take a mental break it, it's over you might, be, you might be dead you in jail the woman gone, something, something finna happen because you was off your game and you can't afford to do that because you always got this target on your back. This is systemic, you know, you playing in the streets. You know what I'm saying? It's their job to get you, it's your job to get away. You know, so <laughs> you can't afford no mental breaks. I, I think, I'll, I'll just touch on this a little bit and then we'll get into our talk on racism, but and, and, and the whole situation that's going on with the with our country and probably other countries too in, in different ways. But if you grow up in the hood, you, you a lot of what I see after doing so many of these interviews with people from from these families, these these sub these cultures, these uh, you know the South Central LA, uh, Chicago, you know New York's got it. Every, every almost every big city has it. Right. Oakland, certainly. Um, people grow up without any role model, without any hope. They're, they're not going to become a nurse like their next door neighbor did or like their sister did or their, their mom. They're not going to become a, a, a lawyer or a doctor or a, you know, something respectable like their dad did because dad was in prison. Mo mom's on drugs or mom's working the streets or mom's doing something that's not quite you know, I'm, I'm, I'm generalizing, of course, but there's not a whole lot of examples of what you can do with your life when you're a young man or a young woman. Like I had, like I had a lot of great examples. Like, oh shit, I have all these choices. Which one do I want? Which one works for me? And I followed one of them and that led me to where I, where I ended up, where I am today. But I see with these, with a lot of the kids I interview, a lot of people I interview, they're, they never had that chance. They never had that opportunity. Right. So these women are trying to figure out a way to survive. What's a woman going to do to make money? You know, guys can hustle, guys can steal, guys can do a lot of things. Um, but a female doesn't quite have the same options, but, but her attractiveness can make her money quickly. But they, don't, they never learn how to handle money. This is a white man telling a black man <laughs> how it is in the hood, but mm -hmm. tell me if I'm wrong. Um, the... The women never learn, the men too, but I think the, a lot of the gentlemen of leisure, as you call yourself, understand how to handle the money, how to manage it, so that the, it just doesn't just get spent on, on garbage. Right. So that you guys can at least have a roof over your head, have a car, have clothes, have, have a nice lifestyle so you can make more money and, and live a better life. Is that, is that basically the, the pimp right. game in a, so, in a know, nutshell? So, you know, it's always exceptions to the rule. There's some women who... Oh, there's, and there's some terrible pimps, right. too. That is always... Uh, we have to look at the total spectrum, so, you know. But generally, if uh, a, 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 a gentleman sets himself up in that position, then you understand that your role is to take care of this woman. And she's coming to you looking for guidance, looking for companionship, looking for acceptance. And it's your job to take care of her and everything that comes with her. And so what I tell people is, and people talk to us, say, listen, don't take this woman money if you're not going to really be committed to what she's asking you to do because she's asking you to be her man. She's trusting you with her life. She's trusting you with her everything. And if for you to not take that serious or to you just be playing with this, with what she's doing, she's risking everything to trust you. And so that's a big responsibility. And so... <laughs> Uh, and, and, and you can see it from that standpoint, you can see why a lot of women say, no, I'm not risking all that. I'm not. I'm, I'm rather to be independent, you know. And they'll take all these chances. And, um, and you know, when you say independent, I'm like, well, who are you independent from? What, ain't you saying we originally belong together? It's like, oh, okay. Well, so if you're independent from me, you got to do your job and my job. So you got to work. You're working harder. You know, and that's, you know what I'm saying? You got to do both jobs. So... From that standpoint, it's it's a it's a trap for them too. This is the same trap that the system set because this, she's out here. She has to, like I said, she has to play both roles. She has to think about trying to save and manage her money, and she has to think about the job that she has to do. Now we out here in Hollywood, 
All the, none of the professional entertainers work that way. The professional entertainers, they go hire an agent, a manager, a coach, somebody behind the scenes that has a vast amount of knowledge about whatever genre that they in that's going to give them direction so that they can win. We don't call them people pimps. We call them agents, managers, and coach. But they're doing the same exact thing. Mm -hmm. They're doing the same exact thing. And so a professional lady in the game, uh, a professional lady of leisure, she's, she's going to look for someone who understands her and understands what she's doing. And accepts it. And accepts her, appreciates her, and approves of what she, everybody is looking for that. And she can't get it but from one person. Because the rest of society is look, thumbing their nose on her. Oh, mm, you do that? Oh, you sell, you know, the average woman refuses to sell her time and companionship, not sex. She refused to sell her time and companionship. And this woman is getting paid off of Thomas Wainship. She represents a thing. You know, women, powerful women like that have always been a threat. Always been a threat. When you have some type of power over man, especially, you know, you get you know, you get into a dangerous territory. You know, King James burned a lot of women for all of that, you know. <laughs> Put them on the stake. One man had too much power, she had to go. And this has been going on since since whenever. Well, I mean, Europeans came here and... and there, there, there you go. Since, to, kind of, since what, the Europeans being in power. What, what, what do we do to the American Indian? <laughs> right. We, uh, and so we have to be honest about that. So I, that's what I like about you is that you really need to have an honest conversation. And, and, and the generations have kind of... of, of white America have divorced themselves from the past and they say, hey, we didn't do it, you know, well, okay. But we don't live in a vacuum. The past is connected to the day. So in order to really get deep about this racism conversation, we have to address the past. We can't not address colonialism that when Europeans came over here, they just had, had a free reign and it was like, oh, every, everybody back home, nobody know what we're doing. We just gonna act a fool, we gonna kill people, rape people. And, and it was no, you know what I'm saying? And you think that that's not gonna come back and see, what gets me is you watch Fox News and you get on the news and they complaining so much about black and brown people. You don't think, you don't think it's coming back around? You know what I'm saying? You, you, you don't think your actions, it's like the naivety to say that, to think that, in, in, you know, in this book you got to say that the sins of the father follow to the third generation. So you did wrong. Your books say that you reap what you sow. And you're not trying to really make nothing right, but you're still complaining about the situation. Like, you never really gave us no therapy after slavery. You just kind of let us out after you had already brainwashed us into your religion. Then you, you, know, you say, hey, well, okay. And then you can talk about everything we're doing, all the black people acting up, brown people attacking the border. Well, where we learned it from? When you put us in the backyard, you say, made us call your master. You know what I'm saying? You made us forget all, all our culture, all our, made us adopt your way of looking at the world, and then now you blaming us? <laughs> no, I don't get to work that way. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, uh, you know, I think, but at the same time, at the very same time, I still believe America is the greatest country in the world because anybody can come here and win if you know how to play the game. And so, you know, we have issues, but it's still the greatest place. And America's a great country. Yeah, it's a, a great lot country. Of people, you know, you, you, could, you could look at what we did to the American Indians, and that was horrible. Right. You can look at what we did to the Africans when we brought them over as slaves. That's horrible. And racism still continues. But on, on the other side of the coin, like after World War II, the United States could have owned the planet. We could have taken over every single country on the planet. But we didn't. We should, we decided not to do that, and just let every country kind of have its own somewhat independence, and let them do things the way they wanted to. We didn't take over, and you know, that, there's there's that's seldom talked about, talked about. But whatever. I mean, that that's just the ups and downs of of the United States. But I still believe in this country, and, and that's why that's why I'm doing this project. I be, I believe in the country, but I, I believe that really that the white supremacists are threatening to ruin everything. You know what I'm saying? And I really think uh, this principle of anti-racism, I'm really against it because I think it's a really bad idea because the, uh, the colonial era was hundreds of years. You know what you just talking about? This country is founded on these evil roots. 
okay? Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, the genocide of the red man, the saving of the black man. So you could tell a tree by the fruit it bears. So like if you plant a tree and it's on this evil, like how can you really expect it to turn into something great? You know what I'm saying? And you started something, the origins of it is shaky. So um, the white supremacist, this legacy of white supremacy is still threatening to mess up everything unless we kind of, we really figure it out and have these tough conversations because, you know, they have their ideology. And I asked you about the great replacement theory. Uh, that's something that really needs to be talked about because the great replacement theory is the current generation of white supremacists who are saying that basically we feel so threatened that we finna just start killing people. And we, we, we gonna relive this legacy of terrorism. Domestic terrorism is up ever since anti-racism came out. Since 2020 when George Floyd got killed and they started the big anti-racism movement, which was basically, anti-racism basically says, hey, white people, stop being racist. Please stop being racist, you know what I'm saying? And we like, you know. But the thing about that is, the whole world was set up, uh, the colonialism and all that, everything was set up, this system was set up, so you're asking people to go against their own self-interest. That's not smart. <laughs> uh, for me, with the 48 Laws of Power, mm-hmm. this guy, white supremacists probably hate this guy, <laughs> hate him for writing <laughs> that book, because he really put out the power, all the rules to the game. So Law 13 said, if you need to ask somebody for help, you're not supposed to appeal to their mercy and gratitude. You're supposed to appeal to their self-interest. So if you tell them white people, hey, stop being racist, and the whole world was set up, you know, for them, uh, for the for them to kind of benefit from privilege in certain aspects, you finna have a good fight on your hand because I study European history. And anytime you force a group of white people to do something, it's about to get serious, you know. <laughs> It's about to be a war. Somebody finna die that day. You know what I mean? So you, that's just, you know, that's just the history. So I think it's a terrible idea. Planetary chess is based on counter racism. So instead of trying to force white people not to be racist, instead, what if we educate black people to stop falling for systemic traps? And then we can eliminate systemic racism that way. We can say, oh, this is a trap. The police pull you over and you don't respect this man and understand the power situation going here, understand that this man can end your life right now and he might get let off. The police might not, they might not do nothing to him. We've seen this happen time and time again. And, uh, and so understanding that is like surrendering at the moment and not making yourself, putting yourself in position to be killed and say, hey, okay, Mr. Lawman, you got it. You got it, you know what I'm saying? And I, I play, I play that game. I've been playing that game since forever. That's what I got. Well, that's why I wear this cowboy hat. I used to wear. I used to drive a 1991 Cadillac all over the country, and uh, the police used to stop me all the time, thinking I was a dope man. I said, "Hey, Mr. Long Man, I, I don't, I'm not the drugs. I don't, I don't do drugs. I don't have no drugs." <laughs> and I put on this cowboy hat, and I would see the law man. You know, they, he he got a profile. He doing his job. I understand that. But when he got up next to the car and seen my cowboy hat, it didn't register in his profile. I said, that's not one of the guys we're looking for, you know. And they would ride by. And I've been wearing a cowboy hat ever since. I said, oh, yeah, <laughs> this is a survival tactic, you know, because it, I'm disarming him. It, it's it just in that second, on that movie, uh, the, the Great Eight or The Crazy Eights with Samuel L. Jackson, he said, a nigga not safe unless white folks is disarmed. And my cowboy had this disarming tactic because they say, wait a minute, he not one of them type of brothers. He trying to be like us, even though black people was the original cowboys. They called them cattle men. They didn't want to be called no boy. Black people was cowboys. The, the white man was called the cattle man. You see what I'm saying? So now they say, oh, I put my cowboy hat on, now they think I'm trying to be like them. <laughs> The irony, you know? Yeah, <laughs> so, uh, no, nah, but I've been in multiple, uh, every time I get into it with police, hey, how you doing, sir? Oh, man, listen, I'm all the way in the wrong right now, you know? I don't have no license, um, but I'm just 
you know, going around, oh, okay. All right, well, you spoke to me respectfully. You look like a nice young man. Listen, just make sure you go straight home because if somebody else pull you over, you might not be this lucky. <laughs> well, right. It's going to require change on both both parts. You and know, uh, the, I think I think the change mostly is I, I think we're mostly account. We have to have we have to have accountability, black people, because we've been seeing the same game for like we can't keep losing the same game for four hundred years. We can't, you know what I'm saying? Like not understanding the play and not understanding in which ways have we won in this strategic thing. And like Haiti, of course, we talk about Haiti. They uh, had a, a time where they overthrew racism, white supremacy, right? So we have to look back at that and say, well, what, what did they do? What did they figure out? And it's rumored, Mr. Robert Greene said that they stumbled upon a copy of The Art of War of, of Sun Tzu. And then The Art of War, Sun Tzu says that if you know your enemy and you know yourself, then you can win any war. And he also says that the supreme art of warfare is to defend a, is to defeat an opponent without fighting. And so that's what planetary chess is about. Planetary chess is saying that we can end this thing just by being sharper, just by being smarter and understanding the whole thing. So I want to understand white supremacy to the total. I'm not. I want to understand everything about it. So that's why. My research, I just wrote a research paper, and the research paper is connecting the Great Replacement Theory to Dr. Frances Chris Wilson, the Color Chris Theory is what her name, her theory was. And so um, that way we can say, hey, we understand what's going on here, and then try not to provoke the white supremacists, you know what I'm saying? Like, goodness, that's why I say anti-racism, please, is bad. Like. <laughs> Leave leave white supremacists alone. Like um, in eighteen fifty, it was a white supremacist. His guy, his name Go Gobino, uh, Gobino. In eighteen fifty, he was concerned that it was over for the white race. Then this guy ended up being the father of the Aryan Brotherhood. So this has been a concern that um, white people was maybe on the way out. And so, um, the, explain, you explained on this. On, you told me this on the phone call we had this week. Right. Explain that again. Why, why the fear and white people kind of okay. came from? Oh, well, okay, let's, let's go. Because I asked this question to a lot of people. And I said, well, why do you think racism started? And, you know, people kind of dance around the answer. But Dr. Frances Chris Wilson, she broke it down. <laughs> you know, this is a third generation like scholar. And so what she said was, she said, when Europeans uh, left Europe in the 15th and 16th century, everywhere they went globally, they ran under people of color. Red people, black people, brown people, yellow people. And when they start raping these women and the babies came out, they look, this baby not white. This baby got some color. <laughs> and then, they had a thought, they said, well, wait a minute. We can't be too friendly with these people because if we too friendly with these people, ain't gonna be no more white people. So this is the real conversation that the white supremacist understands. The white supremacist understands that we mixed in too much. <laughs> you know, we gotta look at it from his point of view. Because a, a white woman and a black man or vice right. versa has a child 95, 98% right. of the time, it looks like. Yeah. So that's the, the, the African American. The first thing, the, the original gentleman of Leeser, they understood that. They was the first people to understand that. And they understood that that's the reason that it was a constant attack on a black man, because you had to separate the black man from this white woman. Because if everybody else, you know, but if it's the black man, the baby definitely don't come out. You know what I'm saying? The definite, bef, definitely got some colored in. So we have to put these brothers in jail, or we have to kill them off when we can, or we have to make them gay as we can. Whatever we have to do to make them dysfunctional um, and uh, make them, you know what I'm saying, so they, uh, the family unit is disorganized, separate, divide and conquer. That's the, all, the number one plan of any racist attempt has always been divide and rule. That's the number one tactic. 
I don't care how far you go back and look at it, from Africa to getting over here to the American Indians, it's always the same. And in the U.S., they use crack cocaine and poverty and things always, like that. So it's always the same play. So the black men are in prison. It's always the same play, divine and rule, divine and rule. So it's, we got to study that and understand. So like I said, if they, if they been running the same play over and over and <laughs> over again, like at what point do we say, okay, well, we have to find some type of way to uh, – to have some unity. If they number one play is divide and rule, then we have to try to come together. And so I see so much silly stuff, like on Twitter, uh, black people talking about African people and Caribbean people and foundational black American. It's, it, you playing right into the, you playing right into the trap. You playing right into it. You know, it's, it's divide and rule and all these separations. That's what they, they've always done. They always say, oh, this group of people is uh, Egyptian. This group of people is um, Ethiopian. This group of people, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And they cause, so they're able to cause, when, when the, the, the division, then they sit back and then they wait for the, for the, for the, for the, for the chaos to happen, and then they profit off of, off of everything. What, what kind of solutions do you propose? So I, I, the, Planetary chess. The way the chess, the way chess works is when you play in chess, you don't you 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 look down and you say we got to study this game and we got to study these movements, and so we say oh okay well this is this is the movement he like to make he's likely to make or we study certain tendencies and then we build up some strategy and so but the whole thing about the game is understanding your opponent. So we're saying know thy enemy, and then understand knowing yourself and understanding the game, understanding the total gameplay, and then once you understand that, then you can you can play chess because and there's people already playing planetary chess. There's people already winning and succeeding. You know, black people, black, it's, it's people who are winning in the in who's not really affected by racism like as much, who are enjoying their life and doing whatever they want to do, and so when the Lord's uh, when a large group of us get on that same page, then we'll have some unity, and that's all it's about. And then, like, uh, all this, you know, policy stuff, you can't do nothing without unity. You can't change laws. You can't do none of that without unity. And when black people come together, uh, then we're able to do anything. So that leads to a really interesting conversation because they gave over $500 million for anti-racism. In 2020, everybody, you remember, mm -hmm. everybody, uh, we're gonna donate 100 million dollars to dismantle systemic racism. Everybody was giving money. We're gonna donate. The guy from uh, Twitter, Jack Dorsey, gave Mr. Kendi, Ibram Kendi, 10 million dollars for his anti-racism program. And I'm saying, okay, well, I'm sitting at home because I've been making films since 2014 trying to educate people about systemic racism. I first started, it's on YouTube. And my first film was called Good White Folks. Because you good white folks, you know what I mean? When I say that, good white folks. If it wasn't for good white folks, we might still be in somebody's backyard. You see what I'm saying? So I'm above the racism conversation, but I'm looking at the white supremacists because I always got to watch the white supremacists. Then that's the elephant in the room. And see, anti-racism is not looking at the white supremacists. The, it's the white supremacists who create these, uh, who kill people like George Floyd and create all these different reasons for you to donate all this money. Systemic racism in the individual heart and mind of a white supremacist are two different things. You can donate money to, the, to whoever you want. They don't have nothing to do with the average racist around the corner. He's still going to be a racist. So you know what I'm saying? So you're not really affecting the problem. So instead of playing this game, why don't you just start educating black people? Like, hey, listen, it's, a, it's, a, it's some white people, not all white people, but it's some white people who looking to kill you whenever they get a chance, who looking to do harm to you. You cannot just be, you can just be in the water, you could just be in Walmart with a BB gun and they can come in and kill you. You could just be on the corner, a 12 year old on the corner and the police come up and kill you. You could just be taking a block, a walk in your park, a jog in your park, and three-way men. You know what I'm saying? So we have to always know, hey, it's a war going on out here. You not, it's not good. It's a war going on out here. And so, from that standpoint, 
we really have true education because we really educating ourselves to survive. This is true education. So this is what counter racism is. Counter racism is saying, hey, listen, you need to keep your eye on what these white supremacists is doing. And so, <laughs> the, like I said, the interesting thing is, if you can give $500 million to tell white people not to be racist, my project, I'm asking for a $5 million investment. And I'm saying, not, I'm not asking for a handout. I'm saying this is an investment into our scholarship, into black scholarship. Because we got research, I got a research paper. Look at my research, you know, you can look it up. Research paper and all this and that. Now, if you can give all this money to that, but you can't, because I, I have a, a campaign that I started. I told you I'm into the public relations. So I had a campaign, so I was pushing out this research paper to all these go different organizations who say that they care about ending systemic racism, about dismantling systemic racism. But when I sent them this research paper, and I had the research paper analyzed by AI. So the AI said, when, they added, when artificial intelligence analyzed the research paper, it said, this is pivotal in the field of social sciences. I said, it said, this mandates a change in the conversation. So I'm like, oh, okay. I'm getting, I'm feeling myself. So I started sending it out, but they, they ignored it. They weren't interested in it. How can you have a stated mission that says you want to dismantle systemic racism, and I send you a research paper that talks about the psychological underpinnings of racism and connecting modern racist, racist rhetoric with past theory, a theoretical scholarship is what they want to call it, and you just totally ignore it. You don't have nothing to say. At least criticize me and tell me I'm wrong or something, but you just totally ignore it. So it opens the door to say, can America survive without taking advantage of black people? Can it survive? Can it survive? Do, must they um, put black people in this place of, uh, like you said, growing up without the fathers and this constant slide of jail or the penitentiary? Is that necessary for America to survive? I don't. I'm trying to. I'm, I don't. I don't believe so. I don't see how it would help anything. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying that it, you do better to empower black people and make it so that now we understand the traps and we being more productive, and this is good for the country. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Counter racism, educating black people, you know what I'm saying? So like, that's what my project is about. I'm, I'm not concerned with trying to, it's like in chess match. If we playing chess, I'm not gonna ask the white side of the chess board, hey man, can you ease up a little bit? Can you take it easy? I'm trying to get it together. No, I'm finna study you and look at you and figure out your moves and try to get ahead of you. And then I'm trying to put you in a position where you can't ignore what I'm talking about. And that's what I kind of did with my uh, public relations thing. So I wrote a blog, because I knew that these organizations was going to pretty much ignore me. So I wrote a blog every day, sending a letter to these people, but I put it in the court of public opinion. So now I say, well, everybody got to see how you was denying this research. And uh, I got an article coming out uh, recently from a, a media, a news outlet, who decided that they wanted to air that story. That's so great. I just want to put this message out, like, you know, like, this is a great country, you know what I'm saying? You know, this is a system, you gave so much money saying that this was something that you was concerned about doing in this systemic racism, okay? We got a problem. I'm offering a solution, you know, based on theory. And then in my life, I don't think anyone has more practical knowledge about systemic racism than me, of what I've been, of the situations that have to live in my lifestyle to, to, to succeed. I've been in the life, I was in the life for 13 years. I didn't spend a night in jail or the penitentiary or a night in the hospital even, never carried a gun. And so, um, I don't think nobody have more theoretical or practical knowledge about systemic racism than I do. And like I said, you look on YouTube, we got many films. I, I made a film in September, and the name of the film is called, you're gonna laugh, We Fucked Up Systemic Racism. Because I believe systemic racism is really on the way out, and a new era 
of knowledge and um, balance and harmony is coming to the world. And, um, and, and this is an old system that's really decaying, you know what I'm saying? If and you so, look in a country like, uh, like England, where there are, there are African, people of African descent there, but they're educated and they're much more sophisticated than what you'll find in the hood here in the United States. It shows you that, that it's really just a matter of education and upbringing and role models, I think. That, but I'll also, I get stories to my email about racism, uh, anti-racism, systemic racism, and, and the reports and racism in Europe and over there is getting really, really bad. Is they saying that uh, it is getting bad? And I, I mean, I guess it kind of makes That's sense. That's probably against Arabs, though. Uh, that too, that too, and uh, so, um, like I said, I the, think most of the solution is just being able to have honest talks and just being able to talk about it. It's like people don't even want to have the conversation, you know. So I really applaud you just for having these conversations, you know, and, and just putting it out there because it's really something. It's, it's a tough. Yeah, it's definitely a big problem. It's been a problem for centuries now. But to me, the solution is somehow, I mean, it, you know, putting in, you know, improving the education that goes on mm -hmm. in, in poorer communities. I got a question I want to ask. Well, so what do you think about organized religion's role in all of this? I see. Just keep me, I stay away from religion. Yeah? I, I don't get involved in religion. That's not my specialty. Okay. See, I mean, some people are into that, and I'll let them have their. I party, think it's, it's I, so. That's that's another big part of of, of planetary chase because I said there's know thy enemy, but it's know thyself. And when you're talking about self, you, you get into a, a religious or a spiritual type of type of conversation. And I'm really a spiritual advisor, along with a gentleman of leisure. <laughs> I'm a yeah, spiritual. I'm, I'm advisor. the least religious person you'll find. Huh? I'm the least. So organized religion and um, systemic racism are based on the same shit. It's the same fundamental base, basis. It's a it's an overwhelming desire to be special. And say, oh, I'm special. I'm special. And every organized religion does that. They say, oh, you're special. You have the one true belief, you know? And this is the same type of bigotry, you know, and the same type of uh, bias created that so somebody says, I'm special, I'm better than you, and then we have a war. Next thing you know, we got a war because I have to convert you to what I believe is the truth. And this is so like, this organized religion, racism, white supremacy. Which is what same shit. This is what the what America <laughs> did to the Indian and to the That's what they say. That's, that, that was the playbook. See, nobody ever met Jesus because of his love and mercy and kindness. They always met Jesus through the sword or the gun. It was convert or die. And now you still have this, America is a Christian nation. Hey, this is a dangerous, you know what I'm saying? This is dangerous, you know, because you create division. You create that division. And as it so turns out, the white supremacist is a Christian. You know, so no, I. Like I have a lot of prop, you know. I have, people have a lot of issues with me because when I I was very religious. I grew up with my grandmother. I was in the church five days a week. Sunday school, eleven o'clock service, BTU service on Sunday. Monday was a choir, a choir rehearsal, usher boy practice. Went mid Wednesday midweek prayer service. I went to a mall. I know the Bible inside and out because I could tell you about the white man who put the Bible together. And that's what the church, you know what I'm saying? The church needs to stop, come on, man. The encyclopedia is open. You know, we can go in the encyclopedia and see your history and see everything that you did. Like, you know what I'm saying? So they, 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 that's really, that's the part of the problem. The part of the problem is the religion creates division along with the racism. And so, you, you know what I'm saying? But Nobody. if we're going to change anything, right. there's going to have to be some some concession on both sides. You know, like you're saying, maybe the African American community needs to take a little more responsibility for solving oh, we the problem. Definitely, but we the, definitely need to take the wealthy, the, usually the white community, might need to. to well, if you want to find out what the, what the core of the problem is, you look at what's the one thing that somebody doesn't want to give up. 
power? Well, like money. Right. And the greed, the corporate greed that goes on here, so it's getting worse. You know, you go, look at every co- company. They're, they're getting rid of employees left and right. You go right. to a grocery store, you can't even find a, a cashier anymore. Right. It's a machine. So they've eliminated all these jobs, mm-hmm. and that impacts the poor communities severely. So it makes everybody, you know, puts everyone on their heels, putting more black men in prison. More women are, are trying to hustle to figure out a way to survive. All right. And keeps the poor, keeps the, keeps the wealth gap growing. Yeah, business as usual. The one thing people don't, wealthy people don't want to give up is their wealth. Right. Um, I think all that's accurate. But, you know, this is an interesting conversation <laughs> because I'm into the Bitcoin and crypto. So when, people, when I tell people, hey, I, I, I developed a system to uh, end systemic racism, they look at me like, you know. But at the same time, Bitcoin is a computer program. And it's aggressively attacking traditional finance. It's been attacking traditional finance. One Bitcoin is like $45,000. It takes $45,000 to represent one Bitcoin. That's an attack on the financial system. Jamie Dimon and all those people, be, he was in there talking to the government the other day. Hey, if I was you, I'd shut it down. <laughs> because Bitcoin represents an attack on the, on the financial system. You see what I mean? Mm-hmm. And like you say, the old, the wealth is changing. But we see this in studying history, like uh, I'm, I'm a historian basically. And so every generation have a fight between the old and the young. Every generation, it's always a fight between the older generation and the younger generation because the views are just so different, right? And so that's one of the big things, the wealth, the wealth is transferring because young kids, it's kids who got millions from crypto, from NFTs, from YouTube. And you know what I'm saying? They in the digital economy on the internet and they, you know what I'm saying? Sitting at home making videos and getting 500,000 a month or whatever, or $20,000 a month. <laughs> and so you got this whole paradigm shift in finance and the global economy and it's scaring, it, it scares, it scares people, but you know, that's just the way it is. You know, I think the average, I once, you know, the average length of an empire is around 250 years of all empires ever that's ever lived. The average span is 250 years. 2026 20, make 250 for the America. <laughs> so you, you know what I'm saying? Like I said, take that into account with the foundation of the roots of which the country was built on. We might be approaching you know what I'm saying? If we don't get it together, we might be approaching the end of this great thing. Mm-hmm. So we really have to come together. Like you say, it's, oh, we're going to work it out. It's, 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 it's going to require us coming together. It's going to sure. require it. But one thing we can do is we can chill out with the anti-racism thing because we ain't doing nothing but provoking white people, white supremacists with that. We ain't doing nothing but provoking them because they feeling already threatened and scared. And then you go, don't be racist, don't be racist, don't be racist. That ain't sharp. That ain't smart. You know what I'm saying? Leave them people alone. They are already on the way out. That ideology is already on the way out. It's a dying thing. There's you know? always going to be an, an, un, an uneducated right. segment right. that are a problem, but but they'll become less and less. As but, and that's what's happening. The rest of us and, wise and, up. And, and uh, unless you stop provoking them and then, you know, their great replacement theory is something serious because what we know is, is they're meeting in these internet rooms and they hyping each other up pumping each other up to go and commit these acts. One of uh, those white supremacist guys, his name was Brevik. He did something in Europe, and then he got online, and they write a manifesto, and they basically trying to encourage other white supremacists to do the same thing. And this is what's going on right now, and nobody's talking about it. This idiot, Ramaswamy, the Indian guy, that's running for president, he got on there some recently and he says he supported, he actually supported the great replacement theory, man. He's a dangerous guy. <laughs> he actually, a brown, a person of color, actually supported the great replacement theory. And nobody, nobody really batted an eye on that. Like, no, it wasn't big news and it was, was this guy. He is playing his role. He's trying to get up next to Trump, man. Mr. Trump, he's trying to get <laughs> he trying to get with Mr. Trump, man. Golly. You know, but it's just so obvious, like, 
Come on, man. You know what I'm saying? Like you, you don't know what you like. People can't see, see that. You know, he's just so blatantly, obviously. Um, he, he he was, and I watched those debates. I missed the last one, but I watched those uh, president the Republican debates for no reason at all. At the end of the first Republican, reverse racism is racism. What? Reverse racism is racism. You, you know what I'm saying? That's, I was like, no, you, that was unprovoked. Nobody even asked you about that for you to say that. But he's trying to improve his position with white people so much that he just totally disregards everything that people of color is going through. And that's just, that's just, he's a dangerous person. And uh, I used to not like Tim Scott, but I'm, I, 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 I don't like him because you know, I'm not with the religion thing or whatever, but I kind of agree with him to a point because I do believe that we, systemic racism is falling. It's, 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 it's falling. Now, he go all the way out there and he say it's not a racist state. Come on, man. You can't. <laughs> you pushing the line. But I think we, we definitely are challenging, challenging that. And, you know, I, that's scary to a lot of people, too. So. Who knows how it's gonna go, man? It's interesting times. The most interesting times. Yeah, Jan especially. January sixth. Man, to me that was the tipping point. To me, that's when I started looking up that stat about the average length of the empire. I was like, wait a minute. White people is the white men is trying to overthrow the government. Like, <laughs> this is <laughs> this is crazy. You know what I'm saying? Like, you still it's still what the Senate or the or the, um, it's still mostly white men, right? That's run the Senate, that mm -hmm. actually run the country, right? Mm -hmm. And they felt threatened enough to say that we gonna take, that we still don't, you know what I'm saying? We losing power, so we finna storm the White House. If we, if we don't come together, we're gonna fall apart. We better. Simple as that. We better. So, like I said, you, you, you're doing a lot to, just towards having this conversation as a lot and putting it out there, so. I'm real thankful for yeah, you. Yeah, well, it's an interesting perspective to have somebody from the, from the streets. All right. Well, sharing that. I, I've I've you're, had, you're, you're, you're a very I've you're, lived you're an every exception. I've lived every part of the black experience. I grew up in the hood. My grandmother was calling the laws on the on the. Uh, I didn't grow up in the streets, but I grew up in the hood. My grandmother was calling the laws on the corner house, and I was seeing the police come kick the door in at five in the morning. But the people on the, you know, the the library, the park where I'm from. Uh, I'm from, uh, it's a little park around the block. They took the goals out because they said, oh, it's too much drug activity. So they took the goals down. So um, <clears throat> I lived in, let's say, I was the field Negro. Then when I went to college and I worked at Corporate America, I was 25 years old making $100,000. I went to South Korea as, a, as an engineer. So I was a field Negro, I was a house Negro, and then I went crazy. And <laughs> <laughs> and went off the plantation totally. So, yeah, I got a perspective because I've seen, like we was talking about root cause analysis. I learned root cause analysis working at Siemens in corporate America. So you understand root cause analysis, but you can't, but when it comes to racism, oh, we don't, we don't want to understand root cause. We don't want to do no root cause analysis no more. <laughs> but if it's business, they can find out if a mosquito shit in the wrong place and stop some type of plant or something going on, they can figure that out. They're going to ask why 500 times. They say, oh, the mosquito shit in the wrong place and it caused a malfunction and therefore everything. So we have to correct this action, make sure that we put something up to that this never happened again because we can't lose no money because we're in the business of making money. So for them to say, oh, yeah, oh, um, uh, Y'all gonna be all right or get over it, you know what I'm saying? It's like, no, you have the ability to kind of understand this problem, but here we go again, we're talking about a power thing. If we do root cause analysis and we say, well, what's the real problem here? The real problem was colonialism. That's what I say. Colonialism is the original racism. It's a time where racism was just like, they didn't even know it was called racism. They just was like, hey, we just doing whatever the fuck we wanna do. And here, I don't care how you feel about it, you know what I'm saying? And so systemic racism, all I say is systemic racism is the remnants from colonialism. So 
Colonial say, hey, people say, hey, listen, we know colonialism was wrong. We, you know, it was wrong. We trying to do better. But what remains is systemic racism. You still locking black people up at a level more than everybody else. You, the police still kill black people two times as more likely than anybody else. See what I'm saying? So these remnants is still from that original time period. So we still have to live with this. And you trying to tell us, oh, you know, racism not a problem. What? <laughs> and then the really cold part is you invented this system. And now this is what I came across in my research paper. So I'm into the AI thing. I kept, when I kept comparing my research paper to the AI, it kept saying something. It kept repeating this one phrase. It kept saying, um, it's important to recognize marginalized voices in the racism conversation. I kept seeing it. And then it occurred to me, oh, this is a bias. Because the AIs is only good as how they train off. So the bias is, only white people can talk about racism. You're not supposed to be able to talk about this shit. Regardless of the fact that I'm the one experiencing it day in and day out, I'm not supposed to have no, I'm not supposed to have a definition of it. And that's the, the really cold part about it is, you invent the system, but now you say, oh, no, no, no. This is the definition of the system. Hold on, you don't get to invent this and define, define what it is. You're gonna tell the people that's going through it that they, they can't define what it is. No, we know what it is. We live what it is every day. We've been living with this shit for years. Like, you can't get to tell us <laughs> what racism is. No, 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 no. You don't really know. You kind of oblivious to it because this system is set up for you like this. But you can't tell us what it is. And that's what, like, that's what my research paper is like. No, we're not going to let you define what racism is to us. No. You've been, you've been trying to do it, but we're not going to let you do that no more. No. God bless America. <laughs> They try. All right, JP. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, man. It was a fun talk. Very interesting. I uh, appreciate it, man. Yeah, maybe we'll do it again. <laughs> you know, whenever you, I like to get into that religion thing with you. No, no, I <laughs> that won't happen. <laughs> All right, man. Thank you. <laughs>